glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers in the building, to all our fathers online. Let us stand and go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We come before you as humbly as we can with the spirit of thanks. Father, we thank you for being a healer on this week. Father, we thank you for being a provider. Father, we thank you for being our way maker. And Father, we thank you for being an all-sufficient one. Father, you're our Jehovah Jireh, our Jehovah Nisi. Father, you're our El Shaddai. Father, we give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. Father, we, we love you and we adore you. For we know in your word, God says that if you ask anything in your name, it would be done. Father, we ask that you would settle in this service, God. We invite you in to have your way. Father, move as you see fit, God. God, I ask you to cover our AV team, our band, our worship team, Father. Father, I pray you would touch the greeters at the door, Father. Father, I pray you would watch every volunteer, every member. Father, I pray that you continually just move as only you see fit, God. God, we thank you and we love you. God, I ask you would just remove any hindrance that may try to come against this service, Father. Father, we know you've given our apostle a mighty word for today. Father, I ask that you would just move as only you can. God, I thank you and I love you, God. God, can we just say that? Can we just say, I love you, God? Yes, God. God, God, I ask that you would just continually move on our behalf, Father. Father, we thank you for everything you've done on up for us this week, for giving us the opportunity to wake up this morning, God. God, I ask you to continually move on our behalf. Father, we thank you for the word coming forth. We pray that as you pour into our pastor as he pours into us, God. Guys, we pray for traveling grace over those that are on their way and those that are here, Father. Father, we ask you to continually move on our behalf. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. shackles and set me free wrote me and gave me the victory i've got a reason a reason to praise i can't deny 
know what my eyes have seen What seemed impossible I believe Look at my life, we've got a story I've got a reason, a reason to pray I won't let a rock cry out for me I won't let a rock cry out
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Put your hands together if you're going to keep praising God. Hallelujah. I won't let no rocks cry out for me because he deserves my praise. He deserves every hallelujah. He deserves every thank you, Jesus. He deserves every Lord, I love you. He deserves every Lord, I adore you. He deserves every Lord, you're worthy. He deserves every praise. If I had 10,000 tongues, I could not praise him enough. But every time I get a chance, I'll open my mouth and I'll praise you. I don't want no rocks crying out for me. Oh, God, you've been so good. God, you've been so great. God, you're worthy of my praise. You're worthy of my praise. You're worthy of my praise. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hey, somebody ought to tell the Lord thank you in here. Oh, God, because he woke you up this morning and started you on your way, and he's a good, good father. Oh, God, we thank you for being good. Everything you do is good, you're perfect. 
still as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deep, Can you help me as you call me Deeper, Deeper as you call me Deeper, Deeper Oh Lord you're calling Deeper Deeper yeah. Deeper, Deeper in the love Deeper in your word Lord Deeper in your presence Lord Deeper in the things of you as you call
We serve a good, good father. Hallelujah. Uh, listen, listen. I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Y'all seem pretty dry this morning for Father's Day. Now, we, we, we set aside to, set a, to celebrate our natural father, but today we also celebrating our overall father, okay? So I need you to give it up one more time, please, for me, for the father in heaven that who's never left you who's never forsaken you, who's never forgotten you, who's never gave up on you, who still encourages you, who still comforts you. Hallelujah. So we give it up for our Father in heaven on today before we celebrate the natural fathers. Amen. I, okay, I, I, don't get you, I don't mean to get you rattled up and stirred up, but you know, we go just have to celebrate our Father in heaven because he's been that much more than we can be to ourselves and so we set a time to do that so my name is Kevin I'm gonna go over announcements really quick and we go give it over to what we have a special presentation for uh, Father's Day here so we want to first welcome we 
welcome you all for any first-time guests that are new to Connect Church Plano for our online community. Thank you for tuning in on today as we celebrate Father's Day. And also, uh, I believe we have a word from our apostle which is going to knock your socks off or bless you because uh, when I walked in here, I felt like giving a mannequin a handshake. I don't know who he was looking in the mirror at, but um, it, it, I know it's going to be good. Anytime he got to use props and set it up, I know it's going to be a good sermon. So I hope you brought your notebooks, your pen, your paper, your Bible, your physical Bibles, of course. Online, you bring your, break out your Bibles, dust, the, dust off of that nightstand and bring it open. But uh, Father's Day is today, so we celebrate our f- spiritual fathers. We celebrate our physical fathers. We celebrate... We celebrate our, um, our spiritual father of this house as we set aside, of course, and salute you, Apostle, because for many, it can be tough on, this, on today. Some don't have their fathers with them. Some fathers has left us. But however, God has graced us enough, if you are a member of this church, to have a spiritual father that will text you, call you, pray for you. Let me say that one more time. Pray for you. Those of you might not know, Apostle is up praying all the time for you all, and we appreciate you, sir. We appreciate you. And you treat us more than like a spiritual father because you will rebuke us. (laughs) And also, guys, um, entrepreneurs, if you are an entrepreneur, make some noise real quick. If you're an entrepreneur, if you are not a part of the entrepreneurs group, in the app you want to be a part of it this month or the next two months we are actually going over our apostles book from prophecy uh, to prophets and if you don't have that book I'm sure there are some available for sale in the foyer but we are reading that book and I promise you it's an encouragement It's going to take your business now and scale it up 100 times Literally, if you don't have it, go get it, start to read, and actually buy your own notebook for it to take notes because you're going to need it. Um, After that, of course, we have midweek Bible study. Where my midweek Bible study people at? Listen, Wednesdays are starting to look like Sundays. And that's a good sign that people are actually ready to be fed and learn on a whole nother level because Wednesdays is where the teaching happens. Sundays are for the encouraging and the preaching, okay? So you want to make sure that you meet us here physical for midweek Bible study. We don't have it online because we we did that for a reason. We want you to be in the building, all right, learning, taking notes, rubbing elbows with people who are ready to be fed, okay? Um, For all your other CCP Global Happenings, we want you to actually get into the app. You can find that on the, they thank you very much, Roku, Apple, Google, Amazon, uh, is CCP Global, and you can just get that right in the app. But when you get in the app, also register, okay, so that way you are getting all the notifications of what's going to happen. So if you can direct your attention to the screen, we should have a special presentation for Father's Day. When you're a dad, you have to play a lot of roles. Hey, 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 don't do that. Don't tap on the brake. Okay, All right. When a man loves a woman, he... Honey! All righty, sweetie. This time I want you to concentrate and focus on the ball. You got this. and stops everybody before they start throwing the rocks and he says let he who's without sin throw the first stone 
you do all of this knowing that one day you will get fired because we all get fired but by the grace of God you might get hired back to be a consultant hey sweetie what's up so true so true can we give it up, amen, for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior this morning? Come on, y'all can do better than that. I said, can we give it up for Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior? Come on, come on. I'm just waiting to raise the temperature up in the room a little bit. I'm looking for somebody to be excited to be in the house of the Lord one more time. Is there anybody that's glad to be in the house one more time? It is a privilege to gather in the physical house of God anytime the believers come together. Anything can happen when expectation is in the room. Is there anybody that's believing that anything can happen in this service today? If you believe that, can you stand to your feet and just give the Lord a hand clap of praise and then use your words and begin to Shabbat God and Barak Him and lift his great and marvelous name. Tell him how wonderful he is. Tell him how awesome he is. Tell him how marvelous he is. Tell him how loving he is. How many know he's a father to the fatherless? Amen. He's king. He's Lord. Hallelujah. He's our great deliverer. He's our kinsman redeemer. Come on and give God praise if you believe that this morning. Amen. While you're standing, can you help me celebrate God for every father in the house this morning? Every father in the house. I said every father that's in the house this morning. Amen. Amen. The Bible says that we must honor our fathers and our mothers for this is right in the sight of the Lord. And the Bible also says that it may lengthen our days. And so today we want to really make sure that we honor the fathers in the house this morning. Uh, because as most of us know, it's not easy to be a father. Amen. Anybody can wear britches, but it's hard to be a father. Amen. I know I dated myself a little bit there by saying britches. For all of my young people, that means trousers or pants or whatever you may call them. Amen, somebody. Uh, but let's once again thank God for the fathers in the room today. Amen. Praise God. We do. I do believe uh, uh, I do believe that today the Lord is going to move in a powerful way. I do believe that today that even though this is a day where we celebrate fathers, I do believe that there is a universal word that is going to bless the house on today. Is there anybody that believes that today? Somebody shout, I'm ready to be blessed. Say it again, I'm ready to be blessed. Amen. I guess we can also go ahead and say, I am the next move of God. Is there anybody in this room that believes that today? Somebody shout, I'm the next move of God. That whatever God plans to do in the earth, he's going to do it through who? He's going to do it through me. Look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, you are the next move of God. Amen. You may take your seat in the presence of the Lord. Listen, we got a little bit of a special presentation uh, for me, it was about, I don't know, it's been a little while now. I want to say it's been uh, seven, seven, eight years. Uh, the Bible tells us, according to Matthew chapter 28, that we must go ye therefore and do what? Make disciples. Uh, it was for me about seven or eight years ago um, that a dear friend of mine who pastors a church in Arlington, Texas, asked me, a critical question, Derek, uh, I was at the crossroad dealing with a lot in my life personally, uh, dealing with some, 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 just have anybody ever been through a place in their relationship with God and life? You just got a lot of questions that you have presented before the Lord and you just want to know when, what, why, how, or you look at yourself and you wonder to yourself, how am I going to do this? How are you going to use me to do what it is you want to do in the earth room? Has anybody ever asked themselves that question before that you're wondering how God is going to do it? Well, I was sharing with a friend of mine many years ago, and he said something to me that I'll never forget. It's a statement uh, that I often use today uh, when I'm talking to men. He says, have you ever been discipled? And for a minute there, I thought I had been discipled. I said, yeah, I, I, I've been in church for <laughs> a long period of time. I mean, I think at the time I was closer to my 40s. I says, I've, I've been serving the Lord since my 
my early 20s. So yeah, I've, 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 I've been in church. He says, no, that's, that's not what I asked you. I asked, have you ever been discipled? And so I, I, I thought I knew what discipleship meant until he took some time to explain to me what it meant to be discipled. He said it was someone who literally walks with you and challenges the difficult areas of your life and push you to adjust your perspective as it relates to how God sees you as a man. Then he took me to Genesis chapter 1 verses 27 where he says God made man in his image after his likeness. And so he began to unpack that a little bit and I thought because I was married, I thought because I was a successful, successful businessman, I thought because I had survived some things that that was God's way of discipling me, but I came to recognize that discipleship is not discipleship until someone has been given authorization to look into your life. Oh, I'm going to say that again. Discipleship is not discipleship until someone has been given authorization to look into your life, watch this, and challenge your reasoning and your thinking. Amen, somebody. And so this then started a journey. And of course, I lived in Wiley and still do. Uh, and he says, listen, I'm hosting something on every Tuesday. He says, I think you need to be a part of it. And I says, well, I'll come and check, check the, the thing out and see what it's all about. And lo and behold, uh, Miss Sherelle, I ended up meeting him for about 16 weeks on a Tuesday night every week faithfully. I didn't let anything get in the way of it. Believe it or not, time started at 7 o'clock and you could not be late or you could not get access into the classroom, which meant that I had to drive through traffic to get there every single week for 16 weeks. Nothing got in the way of that time because it was an opportunity for me to reason with myself and comprehend who I am called to be as a man of God. Amen, somebody. And so what happened in this church, we decided to develop a group of men called Made Men. Can we give God praise for Made Men? I said, can we give God praise for Made Men? Now, I know for me what discipleship did for me, it changed my, my marriage, believe it or not, it changed my ability to father my children. It changed even how I pastored this church and, and covered people spiritually. And so I decided to get a group of brothers and we decided to duplicate the process and do the same thing. And let me say this to you, those of you who are interested or have heard about our made men journey or our discipleship journey, it's not a journey for the faint at heart. Amen. It is a process. It is a rigorous process that one must go through uh, because when you're going through discipleship, uh, no excuses can explain and no explaining will excuse. Amen, somebody. Um, it is an opportunity for us to level up and understand what it means to serve as men, not just in this church, but in our houses. And I believe that every brother, every man has been called to be pastor, prophet, and priest. I'm going to say it again. Every man has been called to be what? Pastor, prophet, and priest. If you are a father, if you are a man, you ought to be pastor, prophet, and priest in your house. My name should not be mentioned more in your house than your name. Because you are pastor, prophet, and priest in your house. Can we give God praise for all of the men in this house today? So what I wanted to do today on Father's Day, I thought it would be great to acknowledge our made men. And so first I want to bring to the stage Elder Deacon Kenyatta Runnels. Let's give God praise for him. Come on, come on, come on. Amen. Elder Deacon Kenyatta Runnels, I want to help you. Can you help me bring to the stage Deacon Philip James? Let's give God praise for him. Can you help me bring to the stage Brother Kevin Willingham? got a few others. Um, we got another brother here today that has also been tagged a made man, and that is none other than Derek Meeks. Can we give God praise for him? Come on, can we give God praise for him? I said, can we give God praise for him? 
Now, Derek has been trying to figure out, number one, why did y'all ask me to pray today? Number two, why are my parents here? Number three, why am I dressed up? Y'all know I don't roll like this, so why am I in a black suit on today? Well, Derek, on last year or towards the early months of last year, is that correct? Derek went through the same process as these men. However, due to COVID, we didn't get a chance to come together to officially celebrate and acknowledge the fact that he got through the process in a pandemic. Amen, somebody. In a pandemic. Now, let me say this to you. Many people are interested in being discipled, and it's always interesting, and Elder Ronalds would agree with me, the class always starts out with a packed house. But by the eighth week, it goes from many to few because of what it requires. Let me just give you some things of what it requires. It requires scripture memor memorization. These men have to memorize close to 30 to 50 scriptures in the Bible that they must quote by memory. These men must have a personal banner verse. A banner verse is the verse that they live by. It is uh, their reasoning for why they feel God has called them into existence. They must be men of prayer. Amen, somebody. They must be men of prayer. One of the things about Derek, because when Derek came to this church, he was very quiet, cool. Well, honestly speaking, his now wife said he couldn't really do anything to the church until we was done interviewing him. So he technically couldn't join the church until she gave him permission to join the church. So he showed up every single week, week after week. He sat in the cut, sat in the back, because she wanted to make sure that he got the same teaching and ministry that she got if he was going to be the man that was fit for her. And I'm just so proud to be their God, uh, uh, their children's godparents and just to be able to see what God has done in their marriage is just so encouraging. But Derek signed up and he was a part of it. And we started with a pretty large group and he ended up being the only one that made it to the end. <laughs> made it all the way to the end. Here's some other things that they have to do. They have to raise money collectively. They're giving a certain dollar amount that they must raise collectively. And here's the thing. They cannot reach within their personal accounts to do it. They have to learn how to raise money and be able to challenge others to support a vision that's bigger than themselves. Because if you're going to be a made man, you ought to be able to challenge someone to follow you and whatever it is that you have been called to do. Let's give God praise for that. These men also have to journal. And believe it or not, that's a big challenge for men because they're required to learn the discipline of journaling their thoughts on an everyday basis and then turn that journal in to myself and I read their personal journal and then challenge what they're thinking. Because if we're going to be the men we're supposed to be, somebody ought to be able to know what's in your head. Talk to me today. And so that in of itself require, requires a sense of vulnerability, watch this, and respect. Amen, somebody. Because the anointing you respect is the anointing that you would grow from. And so he came and, of course, submitted himself to leadership. He was stretched. He was challenged. And on today... We just want to personally acknowledge you and say we want you to know how proud we are. And on today, we want to officially label you a made man, made man in Connect Church. So can we, can we, we have some goodies for you today. Of course, you've got your official jersey. That says made man with your name on the back. So we want to give you that, sir, and say we're godly proud of you, man. You got your hat as well while you're out there mowing the lawn or walking the children. Amen. In the park, you got that as well. But more importantly, there's a signet ring that every made man gets when they go through this process. And it has a black stone, and that stone represents authority. If I can open it represents authority 
So we want to present to you today your made man ring, that ring of authority to let you know that we are truly, truly godly proud of you. All right? And then, of course, we've got your certificate that I'll read for them. It says, Connections Fellowship of Churches, uh, of course, made men upon the recommendation of the men of Joshua community does confer upon Derek Meeks the certificate of discipleship, whereas known, shown evidence of Luke 9 and 23, whoever wants to be my disciples must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me, along with meeting the requirements in the area of doctrine, ministry service, and brotherly love. The aforementioned individual committed to refrain from seeking out the world to shape his manhood. That's important. He understands God's original plan for mankind and has been restored in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 that says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heaven, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. This individual understands that he is a son of God, living on earth to resemble the nature of God, the plan of God, and the influence of God. In witness whereof the seal of the church and the signatures authorized by the board of directors, Connections Fellowship Church, are hereunto affixed this 13th day of May in the year of our Lord, 2022. And on today, we present you, sir, with your official Made Man Certificate. Proud of you. Come on, can we give him a standing ovation? Let's celebrate God for him. Proud of you, sir. Proud of you. Amen. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Derek has served in his church. He serves as an adjutant and helps on Sunday. He leads sometimes and does prayer. Um, and it's just good to have men, uh, a church where men are men. Amen. And so if you are encouraged in any way, Say, man, that might be something I'd be interested in. I think we'll do a course or another track of this towards the end of this year. And just to be, uh, just to be clear, uh, to be discipled by me is something you have to be selected for uh, because you and I have to be in a certain place with each other that you trust me and know that I want nothing but the best for you. Amen. Um, and so we thank God for the individuals that have gone through that process. Once again, put your hands together for, for Brother Derek. We thank God for him and all that he has done. All right, here's what we want to do. I do believe there's a word from the Lord today. But before I do that, I want to take some time to receive the Lord's offering. Offering should be a lot larger today, especially from the men, since we just celebrated made men. So y'all ought to be able to make up the difference today. Uh, but on today, we want to take some time to receive the Lord's offering in this church. We do prioritize giving. Giving, amen, is important to us as a local body because we understand that the only way for ministry to get done, it is done through the generosity of people. People responding to what God expects from us as his people, amen. And so here at this church, we don't try to be difficult, strong arm you or uh, use any manipulative tactics. We want you to give by faith because the Bible says it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Amen, somebody. According to Luke 6 and 38, it says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, shall, men, shall God cause men to give back unto your bosom. Amen. If you look at Malachi's writing, uh, you also find scripture there where he talks about the importance of honoring the Lord with the tithe. That is also one of the key ingredients of a made man is they, they actually have to be proven in the area of tithing. Amen, somebody. 
uh, where their giving is monitored closely. Uh, and so these make men are men who believe in honoring the Lord with the first part of their increase because whatever God has you involved in, he wants you to invest in as well. Amen. And so here's what we want to do. First and foremost, we want to acknowledge the tithers in the room. And so if you're going to be tithing today, I want you to stand to your feet so that we can celebrate you just a few free, a few moments. And so let's thank God for all of the tithers this morning. Come on, put your hands together. Amen. We believe in the power of tithing in this church. Amen. Come on. You can do better than that. Amen. They don't have to give. They don't have to trust God. But to be able to honor the Lord in your giving is so important in this church. And we do not minimize giving in this church. And we like to celebrate individuals who support us in what it is that we have been called to do. Amen. And that is starting with the tithe. The tithe is where we give the Lord the first part of our increase. And we believe the starting point of the tithe is always at the 10%. Amen. Uh, it is where we give the Lord the first part uh, so that we can ensure that the house of God is maintained and sustained. It's the only way we can do ministry. As much as I love preaching, as much as I believe in prayer, as much as I believe in the power of faith, amen, what moves the earth is the currency of not my prayers, but the currency of income. How many know the Bible says that money answers all things? Amen. Answers all things. And so your tithing helps make that possible so that there could be meat in the house of God. Now, every other person you say, Pastor, this is not a pay week for me, but I do want to get in on this. I want you to get an offering in your hand. What is an offering? An offering is simply your way of telling God, thank you. That everything that you have was not given by your own strength, amen, but by the goodness of the Lord. And so everybody can pull from somewhere to give the Lord a thank you offering just to say, God, thank you for opening a door. God, thank you for making a way out of no way. God, thank you for being faithful. Thank you for being my father. In the absence of my physical father, you have been a father to me. You have shown me the way of, the, of truth, and you've shown me how to walk in righteousness. And so can you just get an offering in your hand, and I want you to stand to your feet this morning whoever that person is and just say I'm going to support what God is doing here at Connect Church if you're wondering what the mission, vision and values of Connect Church is it is that we are the body of Jesus' disciples where people from all walks of life can come discover God find community and embrace their purpose and I believe that happens here at Connect Church amen and so your giving helps make that possible everybody shout the vision is made possible through me. Amen. You are the provision that God sends to the vision. And so your giving, your support helps make that possible. There are the others in the room that said, man, listen, I, I believe in this church. Uh, I want to go beyond tithe. I want to go beyond an offering, and I would like to plant a seed. A seed is interesting because a seed is different than any other gift that you can give God because a seed sets the tone for the next season. Amen, somebody. A seed literally can shift a season. You find historically in the Bible that anytime someone found themselves in a jam or found themselves in a complex situation, and when they began to go and meet with the prophets and the kings, many times the prophets would tell them, get something in your hand. Because when you release a seed, you're stepping into the supernatural realm to trust God to do the impossible. Is there anybody in this room that needs God to do the impossible? Come on. I said, is there anybody in this room that needs God to do the impossible? I said, I'm going to say that once again. Is there anybody in this room that needs God to do the impossible? There's a story in the Bible of a woman at Zarephath and sent Ezekiel or Elisha, I don't know which the king was. And the king, of course, goes to Zarephath and he finds a woman and the Bible says, according to 1 Kings chapter 18 or 17, she was gathering sticks and she told herself that this is my last meal and it's over for me and my son. The prophet goes to her and says, listen, I know what you've told yourself, but if you bake me a cake first and get me, give me a portion of what you, get, what you have, I believe that what's in me will hit you. In other words, when you seed into me, the favor of God that is upon me is now going to hit your life. And what you thought was your last meal is not your last meal. It's going to be your last plus many more, more, many more meals. And what happened was the Bible says that as the woman of God poured out, she never ran out. 
And I just take a moment by faith and decree and declare that over this house, you're moving into I'm never running out season. Okay, I just need a two or three, y'all. That's all I need. I'm going to decree that again. You're moving into a season where it's going to be a season. Come on, say it again. I'm never running out. Look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor you're never running out. Come on, come on, encourage him in the Lord. You're never running out. Today was your last day coming to church on empty. Then today was your last day where the ends were not meeting up. Come on and prophesy to your neighbor and tell your neighbor, hey, neighbor. Come on, tell him again with a little authority, with a little faith. Tell him you're never running out. I mean never running out. I mean never running out. This is the last day of negative bank accounts. This is your last day of running towards the end, but you're never running out. So a seed does that. She sold a seed and her season shift for the better. And I just decree that by faith, by the authority that has been placed upon my life as the apostolic covering of this house, that this is your last day with not having enough. If you believe that, just slip your hands up right now. God, I just pray in the name of Jesus, you do something in the lives of your people financially because what's happening for them financially affects where they are emotionally, affects where they are spiritually, affects where they are relationally, affects where they are mentally, affects their confidence. And so, Father, I pray that you touch the one area that's on the majority of those in this room's mind is that you do something in the area of their finances right now. In the name of, I speak to every mountain, every mountain of debt, every mountain of insecurity, every mountain of insufficiency, every mountain of not enough, every mountain of negativity. I speak to it now. Oh God, you said if we have the faith the size of a mustard seed, we can speak to this mountain and tell it to move from here to there. And we command the mountain to be moved in the minds of your people. In the name of Jesus, as your people sow today, as your people sow today, as your people give in faith today, as they give, not under manipulation, but as they give in faith, I pray God, jobs and better jobs, I pray raises and bonuses, I pray commissions, I pray income, I pray raises to hit their lives in the name of Jesus. I pray checks in their hands, better, better yet, checks in the mailbox in the name of Jesus. I thank you for sales and cash apps. I pray that you will put them on somebody's mind to be a blessing to them as they sow into the house of the Lord. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. If you believe that, shout two words, I receive. All right, say it again, I receive. If you believe that, come on and put your hands together for Jesus. Listen, we're going to worship a little bit more. All right, that's not, no, 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 that might be. a mic that works. So I'll stop trying to use the mic that interferes with your mic. Thank you. That works. This wasn't on the schedule. So it I wasn't. Don't know it wasn't. But what we wanted to do was make sure that we didn't let the day pass without honoring you oh, as the father of this house. We can clap for that. As you were sharing the story of your own discipleship journey and the development of Made Men, and again, congratulations, Deacon Derek, so godly proud of you. Um, it just reminded me of all of the ways that you have gone first. You've gone first in your own discipleship. I've seen you gone first, first as an entrepreneur. You've um, first in your family to have a marriage that makes it, and first to you know, get a degree and a lot of first. And it's not easy being first because you take all the hits and you make all the mistakes and sometimes you begin to doubt and wonder if you even are doing the right thing. But I want you to know that because you went first, there's so many of us that are able to come behind you, even dare to dream to do a thing because we saw you do it first. Even know that they could be good fathers because they see you doing it first. Even those that endeavor to do ministry, we watch you doing it first. 
And I know that it's not easy to be the first to step out on faith and do a thing. But I just want to say thank you. Thank you for the way that you show up and the way that you father and the way that I see you praying and pushing and believing. And you were praying over us that we would never run out of resources. But my prayer for you is that you never run out of faith and that you never run out of strength and that you never run out of grace and that you never run out of mercy, that you never run out of favor because you dare to follow God and lead a group of people as you follow God. And so I just wanted to say thank you. The gyms got together. Where are all my gyms at? And they wanted to join me in just saying happy Father's Day to you and thank you. And so this is a card from all the ladies of CCP. And then we also just wanted to let you know to check your cash app because um, to collectively, your Zelle. I don't have cash yet. Your Zelle. It, it. It's coming to your Zelle. Christina probably has it in this cash app. It's coming to your Zelle. <laughs> we collectively <laughs> put it together. $450 wow. just to say thank, thank you, you. Wow. for Father's Day. So thank you to all of my ladies for making sure that we came together to bless Apostle on today. But we just wanted to let you know that you are loved, you are appreciated, and hopefully you can take some of that and relax. Go do something fun. Go play some golf, drink some coffee, get a pedicure. I don't know what, what you plan to do, but just do something for you with that. But we just wanted to say on behalf of the women of this church that we love you, we thank you, we honor you for the way that you show up and cover us and teach the men in our lives how to do the same. Thank you. Thank you. We love you. that our God is great. How many know that we should have a great God? Hallelujah. We declare great are you, Lord. Anybody know him to be great? Hallelujah.
everybody stay right here. All the earth, all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are, great are you, Lord. Come on, Lord, lift it up all of the earth. All the, all the earth. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great, great.
somebody of God that is in a season in their life and they have so many questions and they are seeking clarity and so Lord I pray that you use me today to communicate your word in a way God whereby it is made plain Father I thank you for the demonstration of the spirit you said these signs shall follow them that believe so oh God we ask that you would demonstrate your word today somebody shout, shout demonstrate your word today Come on, say it again. Demonstrate your word today. Come on, say it again. Demonstrate your word today. It is in Jesus' name. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap and praise. Amen. Before you, I know you're seated right now, but this is a loving church, and we just, they, we, we were told that we do a lot of hugging in this church, and so forgive us, but we like hugging. So I'm going to ask you to find someone you did not come to church with and greet them in the name of the Lord and give them a hug and tell them it is so good to see you today. Tell them it's so good to see you today. And we give it up to the worship team. They did a great job today. Man, what an awesome display of the presence of God. To see the diversity of the gifts in this church is very
very, very encouraging. Um, are y'all ready for the word today? Right? Um, now, if I can be honest, can I be honest? Holidays are typically very difficult for me to prepare a word, especially when it is a word that I myself am still processing. Um, so they're very hard for me. Mother's Day is hard for me. Father's Day is hard for me. And, of course, a host of other holidays are very hard for me. And if I can be honest, transparent, I spent probably six weeks, Jasmine, trying to figure out what I'm preaching on Father's Day. I figured I could give the job to somebody else, so I called a few friends, hey, what you doing on Father's Day? I said, well, you know, Reverend, I'll be at my church preaching on Father's Day. I said, well, there's another guy I want you to reach out to, see if I can get him to come. He's a well-known speaker, travels the country, and really respects his ministry. I thought maybe that I could, I could pass the job on to him and have him preach on Father's Day. And, and, and it, it has a lot to do with the fact that that although this is Father's Day, I'm certain many of you can relate. I don't know what it's like to really have that sense of feeling and fulfillment from a physical father that is your biological father. Um, so, so I'm just being transparent, you know. And yesterday, uh, the wife, uh, she took me, or really this weekend, we just had a good week of hanging out. And I asked her a question, and I said to her, I wonder how my father is. Uh, you know, you think you're good until you have to face the thing you thought you were good with. Um, and I said to her at dinner, I says, if my father walked in this room, I would not be able to pick him out in a lineup because I have no rep memory, I have no recollection of him. The last time I talked to my father, his 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 question was after a quest of searching for him if you've been with us any length of time you know the story I went for this diehard search to find my father my daddy my biological father now I have a spiritual father in that of Bishop Sherman Allen let's give God praise for him he is a great man I got a chance to spend the full day with him on yesterday and really didn't realize how much I needed that moment uh, of course he fussed the entire time I got a chance to drive him around and do a few things with him and have lunch and dinner with him and just kind of talk. Uh, but it's still nothing like your physical, biological father. Uh, for some of you in the room, maybe your father has passed on, and so you're, you're, you're still processing grieving your father. For some of you, your father may be absent. You know where he is, but y'all don't have relationship. Uh, for some of you, uh, you know your dad, you got his phone number, y'all talk three times a year, uh, but y'all just don't get down like that. And so for you today, it's a little bit difficult. And so I vacillated. I really did. I, I had many topics, many sermons. I, matter of fact, I was so proud of myself because on Friday, I spent the whole day, right? On Friday, so I'm, I'm going to get this word out. I'm going to get it. God's got to give me some. I, I, I have an idea of what it is he wants to take. So on Friday, uh, and God said, I ain't done talking. So he said, okay, man. You. So I sent the message to Deke. I said, hey, change of plans. Um, God, the, the message is different. He, he, he wants me to adjust it. It's not what I said I thought it was going to be. And so on today, I'm not preaching something to you. I'm preaching something with you. Um, and so as I preach this today, I'm preaching through it. Amen. You have messages that you preach that you are preaching from a delivered place. And then you have messages that you're preaching from a place of processing. Amen. And so with the help of the Holy Spirit, we're going to process together. Look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, we're going to process together. Say it again. We're going to process together. Come on, tell them again. We're going to process together. We're going to process together. And so I want to use a, a scripture in the Bible and the Gospels. We're going to be in Mark's Gospel, chapter number 4. Now, I'm letting you know that the, the text that I'm going to be using, I'm going to be using it from the perspective of an allegorical text. 
which means we are not going to look for literal meanings. We're going to be looking for metaphors. We're going to be looking for examples. We're going to be receiving some, some key ingredients in the text to help us communicate our thought today and make it make sense. Now, I'm using an individual as a heuristic device by the name of Jesus. Jesus, who is the Son of God, who walked in power, who walked in authority, but Jesus was never a father. He didn't have any kids. He was never married. His only responsibility, and I'm talking about the Jesus in the earth, not Jesus the Christ. I know he's co-equal with God. He's, he's a father to the father. I get all of that. But I'm looking specifically at the earthly ministry of Jesus. He was not a father. He had followers. He had sons and daughters spiritually. But he did not actually bear any physical children. If you look at the life of the Apostle Paul, the same thing with Apostle Paul. He was not a father. He had spiritual children. Many of his letters, children happened to be churches and he had leaders that he happened to be over like Titus and Timothy. He bore Timothy up from an early year rearing in his days and helped Timothy. And Timothy ended up becoming someone who supported him in ministry. He had Barnabas. Paul was not a father. But there's something that we can extract from the life of Jesus and Paul and other, of the other, of the, of the other leaders in ministry as they do the work of the Lord. And on today, I want to use Jesus as a heuristic device to help us kind of uh, grapple with what we deal with, not just as fathers, but as men. So we're going to be in Mark's gospel, chapter number four. We invite the Holy Spirit to help us teach this today, and we're going to look at verse number 35. Verse 35, if you can stand out of respect for the reading of the word today. It says, verse 35, and we're in God, Mark's gospel, chapter number 4. It says, on that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them. Them is the disciples. They took him with them in the boat. The section of the text that I want to focus my attention on is really part C of this verse in verse 36. And it said, and other boats were with them or with him. And other boats, everybody say that. And other boats were with him. Come on, say it again. And other boats were with him. On today, for the time for our teaching moment, I want to talk from this subject, a man and his mirror. A man and his mirror. Everybody say that, a man and his mirror. You may take your seat in the presence of the Lord. This morning, of course, we gather here to honor and celebrate a role that carries both great honor yet profound challenges. It's a role that can evoke emotion. It can evoke mixed emotions within every man as it holds a special place in our hearts yet it fills us with much trepidation. On a day like today, men and fathers will be celebrated with text messages and emails and Facebook posts and dinners and kind words and gifts, of course, and love. However, within the depths of our hearts, many of us as men grapple with feelings of inadequacy 
questioning whether we truly meet the standards that set before us. The truth holds weight for every man regardless of whether he is a father or not. We all stand before a physical mirror on a daily basis. And this physical mirror is peeking into the reflection of our souls. And if you're wondering what every man is up against when he looks at himself in a mirror, he's asking himself the same question. Do I measure up? Do I measure up? Can I get a few brothers in the room? Is that the question? Do I measure up? As I go into the day, will I measure up? As I manage what my family expects from me, do I measure up? As I go to church and do my duties as a deacon, as an elder, as a lay member, do I measure up? When I go to the corporate office, do I measure up? When I go to my daddy's house, do I measure up? Looking at his life, do I measure up? Do I? When I go to my mama's house, do I measure up? We look in the mirror on an everyday basis asking ourselves the same faithful question, do I measure up? The truth is all of us in this room, whether we male or female, have the same question day in and day out. Is there anybody else in this room that has ever wondered uh, to yourself, am I measuring up to the standards? Because all of us in this room without fail have moments when he or she wonders if they're truly measuring up. And though we may not articulate this question explicitly, our actions and decisions speaks volumes about how we feel deep down on the inside. If I want to know how you feel about you, I can look at your actions. I can look at what you tolerate. I can look at what you accept. I can look at how you are and how you be because your actions reveal a truth concerning how you see yourself that lets me know What you see when you look in the mirror. When we delve into the complexities of manhood and fatherhood, we encounter uncertainty and a lack of clarity. The expectations that's placed on us by society, notice I said society, can be overwhelming. When bombarded with messages to man up. And not be a wuss, perpetual, perpetuating the idea of male dominance and fueling our constant need, watch this, to prove our masculinity. These societal demands weigh heavily on us. They infiltrate our thoughts, challenge our worth, and push us to continually to strive to meet certain standards that at times feel so very hard to even reach. Today, my mission is, is, is pretty clear. It's, it's to unpack the true meaning of what it means to be a man and a father. Uh, and hear me, it goes beyond the confines of stereotypes and societal expectations. It transcends the need to conform to external pressures. What, what lies, hear me, at the core of your every day decisions that as you are the man who is in the face of a mirror there's 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 one thing that I could technically put my hand on that drives everything that I do that drives the decisions that I make drives how I see myself is summed up in one word you want to know what it is it's called pressure pressure everybody shout pressure pressure Come on, shout pressure, pressure. Come on, say it again, pressure, pressure. Pressure infiltrates every aspect of our lives. You don't have to be a man to have pressure. You can be a mama and have pressure. You can be a woman and have pressure. You can be a child and have pressure. You can be a student and have pressure. You can be a widow and have pressure. You can be a child of God and have pressure. There's no age limitations to pressure. Am I talking to somebody in this place? Pressure, it lurks within the workplace. It lurks within our relationships, and it lurks even in our minds. 
believe it or not, pressure is the culprit behind the doubts that plague our minds and fears that grip our hearts. And here's the truth, uh, Brother Jerome, that I came to recognize while preparing this message. Pressure is ubiquitous. It's, it's, it's everywhere. Pressure is everywhere. You go in the store, you're pressured. You see a mannequin with something you like, you're pressured to buy it. You go in the grocery store, you want to eat healthy, but there's the pressure of buying potato chips. Can I talk to anybody in this room? You log on to social media and Instagram, and there's the pressure to be something you are not. You walk into the dealership, you know what you can afford, but this shiny new object is forcing you with the pressure of moving beyond what you actually can handle financially and fiscally. Pressure, it's, it's, it's everywhere. It's ubiquitous. It compels us to question our worth and constantly, hear me, seek validation. But today we're going we to we we look at the various things that we deal with as it relates to pressure, and we're going to confront them Head on. If we were to adequately describe what pressure is, I looked it up. Pressure is described is as the weight or burden of expectation or obligation placed on someone. I'm, 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 I'm gonna give that definition again. Pressure is the weight or the burden of expectation of obligation placed on someone. I'm going to say it again because y'all acting like you ain't got nothing on your shoulders based on somebody else's expectation. Pressure is described as the weight. Pressure is weighty, which is why the Bible says, let us lay aside every weight, my God, and sin. Because pressure doesn't have to be sin to be heavy. Did you hear what I just said? Pressure doesn't have to be sin to be heavy. And Jesus said, I'll put no more on you than you can bear. So pressure is the weight or the burden or expectation or obligation placed on someone. Some of us are stressed out because we've over-obligated ourselves. We've obligated ourselves. We have uh, put ourselves in a situation where we are allowing people to expect from us things that we really cannot do. There's an expectation. Some of you are in marriages where you expect it to be Jesus. And if there's anything that would stress a marriage out, it's when somebody wants the person to be Jesus. Lord, help me today. It's the one reason why you bicker. It's the one reason why you fight. It's the one reason why you cuss each other out. It is because uh, you're wanting your mate to meet a standard that God never expected them to meet. Am I helping somebody today? You ought not want your mate to be Jesus. You want your mate to exude the characteristics of Jesus. You want your mate, glory to God, he or she may not be Jesus, but they ought to do a good job at getting pretty close. Your mate, when they're given a job to fix you, that's a task that they were not signing up for. Oh, am I talking good to somebody today? I, I didn't marry you to fix you. I married you to do life with you. You got to let Jesus fix you. I'm here to support you. And if there's anything that makes a relationship difficult, it's when someone wanting the other person to fix what's broken. And the truth is, I can't, if I wanted to, fix what's broken because you don't know what's broken. Am I helping somebody today? Pressure adequately described. It is the weight, it is the burden or expectation or obligation placed on someone. It is also described as a sense of being under scrutiny and fierce evaluation. Oh, Lord, help me today. It is the sense of being, un anybody ever been scrutinized? Walk in the office, and the moment you walk in the office, you're being scrutinized. You're, you're being observed. You're being evaluated. You're just being you, but didn't know you're being 
evaluate it. Somebody always has an opinion. Never know, never know what you're dealing with. Don't know why your hair is the way it is. Don't know why you dress the way you dress. Don't know why you show up the way you show up. But constantly, day in and day out, you're being scrutinized and evaluated. And when people have an opinion, when they don't have a heaven or hell to put you in, sometimes it can drive you into a place well, you question if you're really called to this. Am I helping anybody today? The sense of being under scrutiny or heavily evaluated, e e often needing to a sense. And here's the thing. When you're heavily scrutinized and when you are very often evaluated, many times you have the tendency to perform even though you don't like performing. It is you show up every day. And you put on a show. Oh, Lord, help me today. And people who are close to you buy tickets to the show. They, they want you to perform today. Y'all ain't going to say nothing to me, but I'm going to preach it anyway. They want you to put on a show to entertain them. They are one. And the truth is because you don't know how to ad adequately communicate how you feel about performing on the stage. It's you're as good as what you did on yesterday. So you're under scrutiny, you're being evaluated, which leads to the sense of need to perform and meet certain standards. And if I surveyed the room, if I surveyed the room and every person in this room, particularly every male in this room, we could conclude that every brother in this room is under some form or type of pressure. Pressure. It's hard. It's arduous. You don't. Matter your age, it don't matter your come from. We go into pressure, the pressure to be just like your daddy, the pressure to, to follow the examples of your mama, the, 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 the pressure to, to obligate yourself and perform. And so, what you're dealing with is various types. There is cultural pressure. Everybody shout cultural pressure. Cultural pressure is the pressure of being strong and independent and emotionally stoic. These are expectations can create a sense of pressure to fulfill certain stereotypes even if they may not align with how you feel about it. Cultural pressures. You even have the pressure of providing. I call it provider pressure. It is the pressure to excel in your career and provide financial stability. It can be overwhelming and may lead to stress, long working hours at the expense of neglecting your own well-being. You've got not only cultural pressure and provider pressure, but now you're dealing with parental pressure. Parental pressure, they may, there may be the expectation to be the disciplinarian, uh, disciplinarian the, the authority figure, to embody certain masculine ideas in your parenting approach. Striving to meet these expectations can create internal conflict and the fear of falling short. So not only do you have the pressure of culture, the pressure to provide, the parental pressure, but now you're dealing with the pressure of comparison and competition, especially when I'm being scrutinized based on somebody else's results. Oh, Lord, help me today. When I'm scrutinized based on somebody else's husband, you know. When I'm being scrutinized based on somebody else's wife, you know. When I'm being scrutinized based on somebody else doing the same job I'm doing but not understanding that they're doing, you're doing more work than they're doing. Uh, Y'all ain't going to say nothing to me. Oh, cool. And so, so you got the pressure of comparison and competition. Men and fathers can feel pressure to measure up to societal standards and, and benchmarks that are set by other people. It's, it's interesting to me that you got a standard for me, but you don't have a standard for you. You got a standard for everybody else around you. You got a standard for everybody that's connected to you. But you don't have a standard for yourself. Am I helping somebody today? When you compare yourself to others, it is the feeling to need to compete. And, and, and that competition can generate stress. It can gen generate anxiety and the constant feeling of not being good enough. While it's easy to tell a man to man up, but what makes the job even harder is when you are having to deal 
with the type of pressure that you're up against that's beyond your scope of control. Now, I can fix what I can control. Y'all ain't going to say nothing to me. I can handle what I've got autonomy over. I can address what I've been given authority over. But what do you do when you're dealing with a type of pressure that's beyond your scope of work? Your scope. Of work is not in your job description, Lord. Help me today. You want me to do a job that is not even a part of my job. Am I talking to anybody in this room today? There's somebody dealing with something that's not in your job description. In our narrative, we have this morning, we have Jesus, who by technical terms is dealing with some form of of all of the various definitions of pressure that I just gave you. <laughs> if you carefully read the text, if you look at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, everybody had an expectation of Jesus. They didn't care how long he works. Y'all ain't going to say nothing to me. Uh, they didn't care that he got tired every now and then. They, 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 they didn't care. All they wanted was the last miracle. All they wanted was the last meal. Uh, all they wanted was the next healing. Uh, they wanted him to constantly prove himself instead of letting his character stand on its own merits. Then when he didn't perform, you've got folk like Sadducees and Pharisees who want to scrutinize and evaluate how he did his job. And then like, I was about to say some, some folk to tell you how to do your job. If you can just work on doing your job and I work on doing my job, I think we can get the job done for the business. But as long as you're busy peeking into my life and evaluating my work and evaluating my ethics and evaluating how I work, how you work in when you're busy looking at how I'm working. So, Derek, if you look in the text, high-level view, once again, we're using it as an allegorical text to lift a few metaphors from a high-level view. It's fair to suggest that Jesus got tired. Can I help you in this room? Men get tired. Huh. Huh. Oh, I'm going to say that again. I know, I, I know, I know it's... Hard to believe. I know, I know because we macho. I know, I know we, we got the weight of the world on our shoulders. I, I, I know, I know, I know because we used to showing up. I know, I know we used to being there. But, but I came to tell somebody in this room, if you just want to know, men get tired. Men sometimes don't know what's next. Y'all ain't going to say nothing to me. So, oh, Lord, help me today. I thought I'd have a few more amens in the room from the men today. There, 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 there are times in our walk, especially when you are a kingdom man. Lord, help me today. Because what makes the job difficult is when you're trying to live your life the way God wants you to live it. And you know back when you were in the streets, there's some things you can make happen. But you know you're not in the streets anymore. So you got to do this thing. Y'all ain't talking back. Where are my men at? Some things you got to do in cadence with God. There's a time for everything under the heavens, a time to die, a time to live. There's a time to plant. There's a time to grow. There's a time to harvest. For there, the timing of the Lord. Everything is beautiful in its timing. And, 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 and the truth is, uh, when everything is beautiful in its timing and you're surrounded by people, people want answers. They want answers. They want to know what's next. They want to know when. They want to know why you sleep. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. They, they want to know. You, you, if you look at the text, they, they folk want answers. They, they want to know when the next record is coming out. They want to know when my project is going to be ready. They want to know. They never ask you how much time you put into what you're doing. All they want is results. Because here's the thing. You do so good at producing results that some people don't know. You take time to process what you produce. They don't know the mental anguish, the mental anxiety that you deal with. To be the kind of daddy that you are. 
You struggle with picking your baby up every first and third weekend of the month. You feel a certain way about yourself every first and third weekend every month. And sometimes you don't show up because you don't want to just show up. You're not just a weekend dad, Lord. Am I talking to anybody in this room today? You put yourself on the measures of stress and expectation, wondering what's next. When society has demands on you, that's hard to measure up. I remember there's one thing that happened to me as a father. I'll never forget it. I was in the court of law debating with my child's mother about child support. Is anything that is very oppressive. It's the fourth floor, the third floor, and the 201st court in downtown Dallas. I get down there and pressure because I bought a new car means you need more money. Never asked the question why you needed a new car. Well, the car I had, my own doubt, it was no good. I needed to upgrade well. But now you're dealing with the pressure of hiding your new car. So get to, what floor was it? Third, fourth floor? Get to the third floor. There I'm before the judge and presenting the case. And the judge looks at me because he finds out that I'm clergy. And he says, doesn't the Bible say you're worse than an infidel? If you ever want to be treated small, it was in that moment Deacon Field was as small as a cup. Because for years I had been trying to prove that I was a good dad. And someone who technically was an authority said something to make me that small. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. That now I spend the rest of my daughter's years trying to prove to her that I'm not what he said I was. At the expense of personal peace. Lord, help me today. Uh, uh, Y'all, come on, talk to me today. Uh, at, 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 at the expense of my own emotional stability. At, 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 at the expense of just showing up, even when I didn't feel like it, even when I didn't want to. At the expense of trying to prove uh, to the child that I'm not what that judge said I was. Uh, that I took to heart what they said. Although there was no truth in what they said because the judge didn't follow me home. Lord, help me today. Stop letting folk who don't live with you have an opinion about who you are in the kingdom of God. Am I helping somebody today? Pressure hurts. But being, we get tired too. In our narrative, we have a tired Jesus. If you look at his itinerary, if you travel back in the chapter 3 in Mark's gospel, you travel to chapter 4, he had a pretty busy itinerary. itinerary. He working all the time. He didn't work corporate hours. <laughs> he was working up day in and day out on a mission from the Father. But what do you do when your assignment makes you tired? <laughs> what do you do when working for Jesus wears you out? Lord, help me today. I'm talking to somebody in this room that there's something going on in your life that's wearing you out. Being a wife is wearing you out. Being a husband is wearing you out. Being a mama, being a daddy, being a parent is wearing you out. Being a CEO, being an entrepreneur is wearing you out because you're trying to fake the funk and keep a facade before people because of their expectations, especially when they are inspired by your life. Lord Jesus, help me. I could handle it if I didn't have no followers. But what do you do when you got 50,000 followers on Instagram who's waiting for the next post or the next content on how to build a profitable business? What, what do you do when everybody calls and got questions? I had somebody call me this week about a question about something about a house or something. I want to know what it's like to move in your dream house and the pressure of living in your dream house. And I'm thinking, that's what you got to ask me today? 
How about you ask me how I'm feeling today? How about you ask? Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. Folk don't care about what you're dealing with. All they want to know is what they are dealing with. Took the call because I thought it was an important message. I want to pick your brain about to move in my, my new house. I'm thinking, hell, I'm doing good to keep up with the one I got. Excuse me. Delete that off of, I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry. Sir, sir in the back, please, please. I'm sorry. I hope you'll come back. I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry. I'm, that slipped up. It slipped, it slipped up. I'm sorry. That just, what's in your heart eventually come out. That's what it say. It's cool. I took the call. I took, I took the call. I took the call because it's my assignment. I don't get to pick and choose when I do what I'm assigned to do. Lord, I'm going to say that again. We don't get to pick and choose what we are assigned to do. There are times you're going to have to do what's assigned even when you're not interested in what's assigned to you. Lord, I'm, I'm almost out of time. Verse 35, it says, on that day, in ASV version, on that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go over to the other side of the lake. The first thing, I know I told you we have certain things that we deal with as it relates to pressure. The first pressure we see in this text from the landscape of Jesus, and I want to use the landscape of Jesus in contrast with the disciples who are watching Jesus. And I want to show you the pressures that Jesus is up against in doing what he had been assigned to do. First pressure we see is the pressure to cast vision. That's, 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 that's hard to do. The, everybody shout the pressure to cast vision. When Jesus instructed his disciples to cross over to the other side of the lake, there was a contrast between the vision Jesus had for his assignment and the observation of the disciples. And this contrast teaches us a valuable lesson about manhood and the pressure to cast vision. Miles Monroe said something interesting. He says, the greatest gift God gave man is not sight, but it's vision. Because sight is a function of the eye, while vision is a function of the heart. So he's dealing with, Dr. D, the pressure to cast vision. Sight is limited to capacity of the eyes, while vision is limited to the boundaries of imagination. When a man looks in the mirror. He's asking himself, what vision will I cast today? And based upon the place he is in, based on the boundaries of his imagination, will determine what he speaks next. The Bible says, according to Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, NIV says, where there is no revelation." People cast off constraint. But blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instructions. This verse highlights the importance of having a clear vision or revelation to guide individuals' lives. Casting vision often involves providing clear direction and a purpose to prevent aimlessness and inspire meaningful action. It's my belief that as a man, what keeps me sane is my vision. I don't care what season I'm in. I can be in hell, but I got a vision. Y'all ain't saying nothing. I'm not saying a physical hell, but I'm talking about a mental hell. Sometimes you're in a low place. You're in Hades. You're in a dark place. But even in a dark place, what keeps me sane is my vision. Look at your neighbor and tell him you need a vision. Tell him again you need a vision. Tell him again you need a vision. I don't care how hard it gets. You need a vision. I don't care how difficult it gets. You need a vision. The roads may get tough. Climbing the mountain may get rough. But you need a vision. I don't care whatever you're going through in your life. You need a vision. Somebody shout, you need a vision. You need a vision. You need a vision. Filing bankruptcy. You need a vision. Get laid off. You need a vision. In the business, when the numbers don't line up, you still need a vision. Somebody shout, I need a vision. The Bible says, the Bible says, write the vision. Make it plain so that he that readeth it may run thereby. Though it tarry, wait up. For in the end, it shall speak and not lie. Somebody shout, I need a vision. 
A vision serves as a guiding post, providing clarity, purpose, and direction. It is the anchor that keeps us grounded and focused amidst the storms of life. Having a vision ignites a fire within the crevice of our souls. It fuels our passion. It fuels our drive to overcome challenges and pursue our goals. When I feel lost or uncertain, it's my vision that acts as a compass. It becomes the anchor that anchors my boat to stabilize me, to keep me in the right place, pointing me in the direction that I desire to follow. I came to tell every man, I don't care how hard it gets. I don't care how much pressure you're surrounded by. I don't care what he said. I don't care what she said. I know he might be absent, but you still got to have a vision. I know corporate America is hard to do, but you got to have a vision anyway. Come hell or high water, you got to have a vision. Somebody shout, I need a vision. Say it again, I need a vision. I need a vision. For where you're going, you need a vision. If you're going to be the next move of God, you've got to have a vision. If God's going to work through you, you're going to have to have a vision. I don't care if it's not financially feasible. I'm not saying a vision based on your bank balance. I'm talking about a vision based on his bank balance. And the last time I checked, heaven is his throne. Earth is his footstool. Somebody shout, I got to have a vision. It's what's going to fuel you. For Jesus, as the Son of God, he understood the importance of vision for his design, the, the divine assignment, which drove him to lead others to the other side of the lake. If you look at verse number 36, verse 36, walking through it just exegetically, and we get ready to get out of here. It says, leaving the crowd. Sometimes when you got a vision, you got to leave some folk behind. If I'm reminded of what God tells Abram, he says, I want you to leave, Genesis 12, your kindred and your kinfolk. And don't take nobody but your immediate family. Because what I'm about to do in you and through you, you're going to save their life too. But I got to get you to myself. Man, let me tell you something. Sometimes God will get you to yourself and talk to yourself and tell you what it is he's expecting you to do. And don't expect everybody to understand the interpretation of what God has placed on the inside of you. So the Bible says that Jesus, leaving the crowd, Jesus, leaving the crowd, he understood the assignment. And the assignment, Ken, was to take people to a place they have never been. Lord, help me today. What if I told you before I can go there, you got to go there first in your mind. I'm going to say that again. Before I can go there, you got to go there first in your mind. Oh, if you want me to buy into where you're going, go there first in Paint the picture. Tell me, oh, Lord, help me today. Oh, Lord, help me teach this thing today. You got to go there first in your mind. Jesus understand the, understood the importance of vision for his assignment, which drove him to lead others to the other side of the lake. Look at verse 36. It says, leaving the crowd, they took Jesus along in the boat just as he was. Now, the part of the text is extremely interesting to me. Uh, Brother Ricky, it says that other boats were with him. It's the other boats that was with him that creates a theological conundrum in the text because it's okay for me to do my assignment, but what do you do when other folk are watching? Folk, you didn't invite to the other side. Lord, help. Oh, Lord, help me today. Folk who carpooling to watch you be the next move of God. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. What do you do when folk you didn't sanction decide to go with you on the other side of the lake? It says other boats were with him. And I, 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 not only uh, do, do we notice the pressure to cast vision. Uh, but, but Jerome, now we see the pressure to model vision. You can cast it, but there's a difference between casting vision and modeling vision. Talk is cheap. Tell me what you do when nobody else is looking. Because integrity is what you do in the dark. And I'm not talking about the dark of a light switch. I'm talking about in the dark, seated days of your life. When things are not agreeing and lining up, what are you doing in the dark? And the Bible says we see that he's got the pressure to model 
vision. And this is, in my opinion, a key aspect of this narrative because it isn't in the vision being casted in this section of the story that Mark, it's, it's, it's the fact that the other boats were with him. The thing you have to see is that casting vision is not just sh merely sharing some lofty ideas or painting a pretty picture for the future. No, it goes more deeper than that. It's about igniting, igniting fire within your very being, a fire that pierces through the doubts and fears that hold you back. It's about stepping into the realm of the spirit of divine possibility and embracing the responsibility that comes with that. But here is the challenge that most men grapple with. What happens when your decisions have a ripple effect, not just on your own life, but on the lives of those who's connected to you? Because if you look at the text, it says they only went to the other side, Cavantre, because Jesus invited them to the other side. So I'm buying into your vision. Not understanding that there's warfare in following you, Lord, today. And I'm trying to figure out that if you hitching a ride with me in my boat, y'all ain't going to say nothing to me. You ever had to pick anybody up who hitched a ride to church and them jokers had to know to fall asleep on the way to church? Give me some conversation or something. Put some music on or something, or you just along for the ride. So Jesus gets in the boat, and the Bible says the other boats went with him. But what's interesting about the whole narrative is that I believe Jesus is keenly aware of the warfare sign to going to the other side. But instead of Jesus making a decision to do something about it before he gets in front of it, this Negro goes to sleep. I'm trying to figure out hell is breaking loose and you sleep on the job? Where you at in your mind? How, it's in the text. How are you sleep and hell is breaking loose? Lord, anybody ever been there? That, 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 that there are some storms you don't bother to even respond to. Lord, help me today. When you, Lord, I'm trying to help somebody understand this thing today. There's some things that are beyond your scope of divinity and your scope of control. And when it's beyond your scope of control, there's a sense of inner peace that God will give you to say, don't worry about it. Don't and, and I came to tell some brother, you can go to sleep in this season. I know, I know some folk ain't going to be able to handle that, but, 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 but this, this, this one you can go to sleep on in this season because you're not going to be able to explain the next move because it's not your move, it's his move through you. They get in the boat, hell breaks loose, Jesus sleeps on the job. And I'm told, as you look at the, histo the, 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 the technicalities of the text, the Bible says he was in the inner part of the boat. So he, he, was, he was in a good sleep. He was in a good sleep. It could be that in his sleep, I'm just saying, he got more vision. Sometimes my mouth don't have to move for me to have vision. Sometimes I just got, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up as wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. But sometimes you got to sleep in certain storms. When the weight of your choices presses upon your soul and you find yourself wrestling within, torn between the desire to produce something great and the uncertainty that shrouds your path, sometimes you just got to sit it out. 
Let's stay in verse number 37. I'm out of time. It says, and a great windstorm arose, and the waves were bre breaking into the boat. So the boat was already feeling. It is in these moments that many men shy away from responsibility. The pressure, the weight, and the fear of failure, it can be overwhelming. But my decree for the every person that is under the sound of my voice, I came to speak something over your life today, and it's simply this. You were not meant to shrink back. You were not meant to cower in the face of uncertainty. You were destined for greatness. And that God has placed within you the power to rise above the challenges, to embrace the responsibility that rests upon your shoulders. It may not always be clear. The path may be covered in darkness and doubt may gnaw at your faith. But in those moments, you must tap into the wellspring of strength that lies within you. And here's something, believe it or not, that took many years for me to understand and honestly accept and communicate as a father and as a man. Y'all ready for it? As a man, we got needs too. We, we, we have needs too. And believe it or not, sometimes it's not always physical needs. You thought sex would fix the need. But for most men, that's not the only need. Lord Jesus, help me today. As, as a man, I came to realize I need emotional connection. I need validation and recognition. I need meaningful relationships. I need autonomy and independence. I need the room to embrace the unknown. <laughs> I need the room to embrace the, the unknown. As single women in this room, if you're wondering what every man needs, he needs emotional connection. He needs your mind and not just your body. He needs validation and recognition. Sometimes he just want to hear, good job. He needs meaningful relationships. Sometimes when you can't be his wife, just be his friend. Meaningful relationship. He needs autonomy and independence. There's something about a man that needs a streak of independence to let him know he's a man. But if you box him into one room, y'all ain't saying nothing to me. Sometimes he needs room to embrace the unknown because there's going to come seasons in his, in his life if he's a kingdom man. He won't always know what's next. In this lesson, we have Jesus who shows us something. He shows us that sometimes in modeling vision, it does require us to learn how to handle the storm. Go to verse number 38. I'm, I'm, I'm closing right here. I got to go. We're out of time. I know y'all got to eat and cook for your husbands and fathers and brothers and, and enjoy each other's company. Has this blessed you today? He says in verse 38. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? I want you to notice something in this section of the text because we not only see the pressure to cast vision, the pressure to model vision, hear me closely, but now we witness a scene that speaks directly to the pressures that we face as men, it's the pressure of a shared response. You want me to, to, res you want me to respond to the storm the same way you respond to the storm. Sometimes my response won't always be your response because I may be seeing it from a different angle or a dis different lens. Jesus was sleep, which tells me he had already had a response that is in the hands of God. The disciples' response was to, to panic and to assume that he did not care. Lord, help me today. Because now they move into accusation accusing him to be careless with their lives Lord help me today to be careless with their lives to not have sense with handling something so sensitive they're in a boat and a storm has raged and Jesus' response is to go to sleep. So you got the pressure to cast vision, the pressure to model vision, and the pressure 
of a shared reaction. I need every person in this room today. Come on, stand to your feet because I'm out of time. I told you it took me six weeks to figure this lesson out. Six weeks to figure out what it is that God was going to say. I'm not the, the last minute preacher who waits to Saturday night to prepare a message for Sunday morning. I take my responsibilities too seriously to do that. But I want to be well prepared. And I said, God, on Father's Day, I need you to give me something to give these men, and not just these men in the room, but to give every person in this room who can understand this word or somehow connect to this word. And God gave me a word that I'm going to give you today. It's up to you to receive it by faith or not, but I know it was from God. I need every person under the sound of my voice to hear this next statement because I've been asking God what he wanted me to say Deacon Phil on Father's Day. And this was his response. Jerome, this storm is on me. <laughs> I'll let it sit in for just a few moments. You'll get it on your way in the house. you get it in the car. I came to tell somebody, this storm is on me. God is declaring to every person in this room, and I want you to hear it in the online community. I want you to hear it from the front to the back. God is sanctioning us to sit this one out. I know you're a fighter, and I know you're from Jersey and New York, but God said, no, 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 no. I'm declaring you're going to sit this one out. Lord, help me today. I came to tell somebody, look at your neighbor and tell them, we're going to sit this one out. Come on, come on. I know you got a knife in your purse. You got a pistol on your hip. But God says you have no need to fight this battle. Take your places. Stand quietly because there's a rescue operation at work. And God said, this storm is on me. Somebody shout, this storm is on him. I need y'all to get that in the spirit today. I know she's sick, but this storm is on him. I know you got concerns, but this storm is on him. I know you're worried, but this storm is on him. Point your hands upward. Shout, this storm is on you, Jesus. Come on and tell him this storm is on you, Jesus. Tell him this storm is on you, Jesus. Just as the people of Judah were assured in 2 Chronicles 20 and 17, you have no need to fight in this battle because this battle is not yours, it's God's. Somebody shout, it's God. So I want you, I want you to comprehend this truth wherever you are in this season of your life as a man, as a father, as a woman, the son and daughter, whatever your, your path is, whatever your storm is, whatever your narrative is, God said you can sit this one out. I, I, I really know that's hard for a lot of people to, to accept because you're so used to being in the know. But God said, you'll be able to sit this one out. I, I know what I heard from God. I, I'm a very strategic thinker. I'm a very practical thinker. And then some things I try to give you steps and processes. And God says, no, this one here. You can sit this one out. Some of you may be wondering, then why is he not require me to fight in this one? He says, because you're on assignment for me now. And when you're on assignment for me, and now that you've made up your mind to serve me, and now that you've made up your mind that you are my next move, he says, now I'm going to work in you the will to fulfill my good plan and pleasure. He said, so the Holy Spirit is going to do the leading. All you got to do is do the talking and doing the resting. He says, I'm going to heal and you don't even know I'm healing. I'm going to move and you don't even know I'm moving. God says, when you go back to work, when you go back to the office, I'm going to soften the heart of men. I'm going to move the bank balance. I'm going to move the needle. I'm going to adjust the throttle. I'm going to touch the baby mama's heart. I'm going to touch the baby's father's heart. I'm going to soften the heart of men towards the child 
child towards the father. The heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord, and he turns it whatsoever way he will. You can set it out. Set it out. Set it out. Set it out. Who's going to fight? He's got angels. He's got angels. Somebody shout, I got angels. The Bible says I've commanded my angels to take charge over you. And when you don't have the strength to fight, that's when you got angels backing you. That's when you got angels praying and watching over you. That's when you got angels orchestrating the move of God in your life. Your only responsibility in this season of your life is to dispatch your angels. your hands all over this room. Just say these words, Lord God, I dispatch every angel that you've given charge over me. Come on, you got to believe that though. You got to believe that though. You're so used to getting in it. You're so used to putting your hand in it. But God says in this season, this storm is on me. You're going to have to sit out on this one. I know you want to get into play. I know you're telling the coach to put you in the game. God says, no, 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 no. You're on bench ministry in this season of your life. You're going to sit on the bench and watch me run the play, but you will be able to enjoy the view. Oh, Lord, help me today. You're going to be able to enjoy the, the view. You're going to watch the replay, and you're going to step back and say, look at what God has done. I dare you to just lift your hands up and worship for just a few moments. Just worship for just a few moments. Come on. Worship for just a few moments. Sit it out. Sit it out. Sit it out. You told yourself this week, I'm done. I'm tired of waiting. I'm tired of waiting. But God says you're going to get supernatural strength today. You're going to get supernatural strength today. You're going to get supernatural strength today. Wait it out. Wait it out. Wait it out. Don't file the papers. No, 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 no. Not just yet. Don't file the papers. Don't close the business. No, 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 no. No, don't give up. Don't give up. There's still hope for that child. There's still hope for that son. There's still hope for that daughter. Don't give in. Don't quit. 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 I want this to be in your subconscious all week long. I want you to hear your pastor's voice. Don't quit. Don't quit on the marriage. Don't quit on the ministry. Don't quit on the assignment. Don't quit on manhood. Don't quit on womanhood. Don't quit on business. Don't quit on entrepreneurship. Don't quit on life. Don't quit on yourself. There's too much in you for you to quit. Here's some final news. The worst of it is over. The worst of it is over. The worst of it is over. You take your rest now. Hallelujah. 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 Just give the Lord a hallelujah. Come on, come on, come on. Hallelujah. Come on, tell him hallelujah. You don't know what else to say. Hallelujah. I give you a yes. 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 I give you a new yes. I give you a fresh yes. I give you a renewed yes. I give you a yes. Cast not away your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again.
I want every brother to leave their seat right now. If you're a man, I just want you to come grab my hand. Just grab my hand and walk. 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 I know so the Aman Sandalama. He can all see an Aman Shando Yama Yeshea. Oh, you have no need to worry. 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 This is not that, said the Lord. 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 Peace be your portion. Peace be your portion. Peace be your portion. I command peace be still. Every nightmare concerning this matter, dreams in your imagination, where you're imagining in another way. I cleanse his conscience right now. Every mind-binding spirit, every spirit, every false imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We bring it into captivity in the name of Jesus, in the name of the sweet name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I saw no command sign. Thank you for doing it now. 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 Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. God says you're gonna have to take your hands off of it. You God says you're gonna have to take your hands off of it. Do this. Just do this. Do this. Do this. You're so used to being expected to fix it. God says, no, 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 no. Take your hands off of it. God says the reason why it's 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 it's, it's the, the process and the cycle is lengthening is because your hands are in it. But God says, I'm trying to show you who I am in you. But just like Jesus, I want you to read the rest of that story. Got up from the bowl from sleep. And instead of Jesus personally working the matter with his hands, he worked it with his mouth. And the Bible says that Jesus pointed and spoke to the storm. As a made man, God says, you got the resources. Wash your hands of it. And he says, and watch me work it out. That's concerning the marriage. That's concerning your child. That's concerning the business affairs. That's concerning your mama. That's concerning your sisters. That's concerning your finances. That's concerning your future. Everything about you, God says, you're going to take your hands off of it. He says, because if you're not, I'm going to continue to frustrate it, to force you to make a decision. You hear what I'm saying? And when God frustrates something, it's usually not good. God says, wash your hands. Wash your hands. Wash your hands. Let it go. Let it go. Tell yourself in prayer, I'm letting this go. God says, the same amount of investment you make in the natural to be a provider, God says make the same investment in the spirit to be the leader that I've called you to be. God says life and death is in the power of your mouth. He says because I put it there and you're operating in my image and after my likeness and because you belong to me, God says I've given you authority to speak in every situation. God says a decision is upon you, sir. A decision is upon you, sir. A decision is upon you, sir. I hear the Lord saying, you must decide. You must decide. I'm giving you clarity concerning your decisions. But I hear the Lord saying, a decision must be made in Jesus' name. Father, thank you. Hallelujah. You're in a season of worship, son. You're in a season of worship. God says you're not going to be able to know the how. You're not going to be able to know the when and the where. But God says you're in a season of worship. If you just worship me and follow my instructions, God says I got you. God says I got you. God says I got you. Father, I thank you for what you're doing in this young man's life. 
I hear the Lord saying, a clean slate, a clean slate. I'm starting over. I'm starting over. Blank canvas. All things new concerning you. All things new. A lot of people don't think you're going to mount up. But God says, I work best. I work best for those who are down for the count. There are those who don't expect much, much from you. But I want you to look at me, sir. I got a whole crowd of people who didn't expect much from me because I didn't measure up to what they thought I should be doing. But when you're in the hands of the master, you don't get to pick and choose your life. That's why certain things couldn't work for you. That's why certain moves couldn't work for you. He says, because you've been in my hands since you were in your mother's womb, I hear the word Samuel come forth. I speak to the Samuel that's on the inside of you and you shall see and do what God has called you to do. I hear the Lord saying, look towards the north, look towards the south, the east and the west. He says, what is it that you see? And as far as your eyes can see, I've already given it to you. I've already given it to you. I've already given it to you. All of the insecurities concerning your fathering, all of the insecurities concerning your fathering and wondering if you're going to amount, wondering if you're going to be able to provide, wondering if you're going to be able to show up for your child the way you want to show up because nobody really showed up the way for you, the way your child, you desire to show up for your child. But God says, I'm going to perfect my will in you concerning you. I'm going to give you the ability to be the man that was never modeled for you to be. And God says the reason why it was set up that way was so that it could not be tainted. God says, I'm using you to change the landscape of fathering in your family. So I lay my hands on you. I lay my hands on you. I impart into you. I impart into you some wisdom. I impart into you some wisdom. I impart into you, some wisdom. I impart into you power. Oh. I'm parting you power to withstand the trials of the day, to withstand the trials of the enemy. I don't care what she says. Call my sika every every lie, every lie in your ears. We come against it now. We come against it now. Oh, but Lord, we thank you for clarity. We thank you for clarity. We thank you for clarity. Touch this man of God. And I call you a man of God. I call you man of God. I call you son. I call you pastor. I call you prophet. I call you priest and I call you king. I call you the anointed one. I call you the cold one. I quote, Shandaya. No good thing will he would hold with you. Said the Lord, I decree it to be so. Stir, stir. Every gift, every gift. Every gift, every gift, every gift. Every gift, every gift, every gift. Come on up. Every gift, every gift. I command it to come forth in the name of Jesus. I command the entrepreneur to come on up and out. I command the leader to come on up and out. I command the father to come on. Touch his heart now. Touch his heart. Do surgery on his heart. Touch his heart. Surgically remove the pain. Surgically remove the hurt. Use it. Use it as motivation to do the thing that he has been called. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. You see all of these men in this line, y'all ought to give God praise because we got men that want God. We got men that desire the sincere presence of God. We got men, I just decree it to be so in the name. Make him a discipleship maker. Make him a discipler. Make him a discipler. Make him a discipler. I hear the Lord say, you're going to disciple men. You're going to disciple men that as God gives you clarity, as God gives you, as God gives you understanding and revelation concerning the scriptures. We thank you, Lord God, that you're raising him to be the man for men. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I was, lift your hands. I started to text you late last night. I 
put myself in the position of your son. And I said to myself, I just want to hear from my father. And I hear the Lord saying, he told me to tell you, and I started to text you last night, tell him, don't bother and worry about the response. Just to know that you care, that's sufficient enough. God says, I'm opening a door. I'm opening a door. I'm opening a door in the heart of your sons. I saw it last night. I saw it just as clear as day. And God says this is the last year where the enemy will be able to use that against you concerning who you are as a man, who you are as an elder, who you are as a deacon, who you are as a leader. I put myself in their shoes. And I said to my wife the other day, I says, I would be good if he just called. If he just checked to just try. And God says, I'm opening a door in the heart. And God says, I'm making room for it. I'm making room for it. God says, you're not a disappointment. You're not a disappointment. You're not a disappointment. You're not a disappointment. And watch this. You are not your father. You are not your father. God says, when I hold you up against him, you are not your father. God says, I had my hands on you. 12, 13 years ago because I knew what I was going to do with you. You were on the path to repeat the miseries of his life. But God says, I had my hand on you 13 years ago because I knew what I was going to work out. And God said, this is going to be the year of your jubilee. It's going to be a jubilee, a relationship. And when the word jubilee comes up, it means to be free. It means to be free. Now, if memory serves me correctly, how old will you be next year? 48? I hear the Lord saying that over the next two years, by the time that you get 50, you're going to be free from everything. Free from everything. That God says, I'm working a 24-month miracle, a 24-month process of deliverance off your life. He says, because the latter shall be greater than that of the former. I decree the next 50 years will be whole, they will be liberating, they will be free, they will be joyous, they will be powerful, they will be anointed. And so, Father, as I lay my hands on this leader, as I lay my hands on this servant, as I lay my hand on this made man, as I lay my hand on this discipleship maker, start in his home in Jesus' name. Do it now. Do it now. takes a process and you put yourself on a timetable that God never put you on 
God says, I know your issues. I know your insecurities. I know what's on the table. I know what you need addressed. I know what you need fixed. But I hear the Lord say, you're mine, and ain't nothing you can do about it. Ain't nothing you can do about it. There's nothing you can do about it. I hear the Lord saying, I'm going to comfort you, but I pray grace upon grace on your life in this season of your life that as you seek to serve the Lord, as you seek to serve the Lord, I hear a scripture in the Bible. There ain't many folk that I call Peter, but you like Peter. And that's not a bad thing because he was very close to Jesus and Jesus really counted on him. But one of the things about Peter is Peter has so much going on in his life that sometimes he would be in and out, in and out, in and out. Peter was both spiritual and natural. Peter would pray and cuss. Peter, Peter would pray and fight. Peter was the guy that cut the ear of a guy off because he stepped incorrectly to Jesus. And Jesus said, hey, not, that's not how we work. We're so full. And so rubber met the road and Peter hit a situation in his walk with God and he, he said he wasn't with him at a time in ministry when it really counted and Jesus, uh, Peter thought it was over. The Bible says that when Jesus revealed himself and being resurrected, the Bible says that he asked for his disciples and Peter. I hear the word of the Lord saying, I'm asking for my disciples and Cavantre. And Cavantre. That whatever I'm doing in the earth, There's nothing you can do to exclude yourself from what God plans to do in your life. Do you hear what I'm saying? And I want you to know that goodness shall come out of your life. That goodness and mercy will follow you. That every step you take, and hear me, it won't always be perfect. It won't always make sense. Because of sin, we're naturally and humanly flawed. But how you know you got an anchor in your soul is when you come to yourself and say, I got to get to church this Sunday. I got, I got a lot of questions, but I, I got to get to church this Sunday. I got, I got to hear something from God. I, I, I got to get in the room. That's how you know Satan can't stop what God has started in your life. So I pray grace upon grace on your life as you do what it is he's called you to do. Amen. Father, we thank you. This man of God, we thank you for what you're doing in his life. We thank you for doors open. We thank you for doors open. I thank you, Lord God, for his legacy years. I thank you, Lord God, that, Father, he's going to get a chance to witness his prayers working in the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. I thank you, Lord God, that in his heart you touch every area of his life, Lord God, every area of his life where he's believing you for, touch it right now in the name of Jesus. We just thank you that he has no need to fight in this season, that he's going to be able to sit this one out. And we decree and declare the favor and the power of God to be his portion in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you. We thank you for what you're doing. We decree and declare the will of God. We decree and declare the will of God. And declare the will of God. God says the model I'm going to show you is not going to be the model that you have seen. God says don't be tempted to follow another man's blueprint because what's unique for you, what I have for you is unique. It's distinct. He says and you can't rush it. He says don't be tempted to follow it. He says but I'm going to show you the way as you build a marriage, as you build a marriage that honors me, as you build a life that honors me. The half has not been told concerning you, sir, but continue to serve him. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you, Lord God. We thank you. We pray for the resources. We pray for the resources. We pray for the resources for this family. Lord God, we thank you for his son. We thank you, Lord God, that even as he accepts this responsibility, Father God, I thank you that he said yes to the assignment. He says yes to responsibility. Now, every place of insecurity where he begins to question his ability, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you begin to open that door. Oh, to open the door of promotion, open the door of more grace, more understanding and power in the things of God. 
Ah, God, I thank you, Lord God, that you're going to even give him clarity concerning who he is in the kingdom of God. And, Lord, you're going to make him a servant leader. You're going to make him a prayer warrior. I thank the Lord God that you're moving him into that season. I hear the Lord saying spiritual developments, great spiritual development, where I'm going to begin to make things make sense for you. The mysteries of the word will begin to open before you. I hear the Lord saying, even through the night hour, begin to open your mouth and begin to pray. God, I hear the Lord saying, you're raising that of a Moses who shall do great things. There's a reason why he's allowed this child to come into your arms. You're raising that of a Moses. 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 You raise, oh, a raising. Just like Moses could not be raised by his family. But God calls him to be transplanted to another family. And God says, you're going to be blessed because of what you're raising. You're raising what my hand is upon. So I hear the Lord saying that every chance you get, lay your hands on him. Speak the word of God over him. Speak life. Speak the will of God over his life because he shall rise up and do great things in the kingdom of God. And so, Father, I thank you that you would grant him the wisdom. You grant him the grace and the strategy to do it in Jesus' name. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you for this man of God. Thank you for this man of God. We thank you for what you're doing in his life. Oh, God, I thank you for what you're doing in his life. I thank you, Lord. Father, I hear the Lord saying, well done. Well done, well done, well done, well done, well done, well done. I hear the word, well done, well done, well done, well done, well done. Well done, well done, well done, my good and faithful servant. God says, I wasn't looking for perfection. I know that's what you told yourself was required. But God told me to tell you, well done, well done, well done, well done. Well done, well done. Your son shall rise and call you blessed. Hey, well done. Somebody holler, well done. Well done. Well done, well done, well done, well done, well done. I hear that for you, sir. I'm straightening things out. I'm working things out. I'm high. I do I put my hand to the secret areas of your life where you need me to work. Said the Lord. I'm putting my hands in the areas of your life where you need me to work. Said the Lord. You shall serve me even in your older days. You shall not leave here prematurely. You shall not leave here without doing what it is that I've called you to do. I decree the Preacher, to come on up. Preacher, come on up. Preacher, come on up. Preacher, come on up and out. Come on up and out. There's a people that need to reach you. There's a people that needs to hear you. Said the Lord. So, Father, I pray that you do it now. I pray that you strengthen him, that you grace him, that you grace him, that you strengthen him, that you tell him, you show him that he's done a good job. You've done the best you could did the best you could with the resources you had but you stayed consistent where other men would have walked away you stayed on in you stood the heat in the kitchen and God says I'm getting ready to show you how to reap what you have sown so Father I thank you Hallelujah. Strength, 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 strength to do the will of God. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. We're almost done. In Jesus' name, we Thank you for making them the man that you called him to be. The man that he's been called to be. The man that he's been called to be. The man he's been called to be. He's not a disappointment. He's not forgotten. He's not left out. He's not forgotten. He's not left out. He's not forgotten. He's not left out. He stays in the distance, afar off. But Lord God, I hear the Lord saying, I see you. 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 And I got you in this season of your life. God says, I'm just waiting on you to make a decision to surrender totally to 
what's next and what it is I want to do in your life. God says when you do just that, just the past will be even more clearer. God's going to touch your heart. God's going to touch your heart concerning your father. He's going to touch your heart. He's going to touch your heart concerning your father. You were too delicate. You were too delicate for him to raise you. So sometimes God, in an effort to protect us, we don't get a chance to experience what others may experience. But the Lord says, I'm going to be your help. I'm going to be your strength. I'm going to be your comfort. And you've got men around you that you can pull from to support you in this season of your life as you journey into manhood. So I lay my hands on you and I decree and declare the will of God, the favor of God, the power of God, the wisdom of God. It is in Jesus' name. his strength in this season of his life, God. We thank you for showing him the way, showing him your truth. It is in the name of Jesus, God. Thank you for the softening of his heart. Oh, God, so much animosity in his heart concerning his life and the things that he has gone through. He's tried to have a good outlook on it, but Lord, there's questions that plague his mind every night. In his dreams and his imaginations, but Lord, I thank you. The peace of God will be still concerning the plans and the future you have for him. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're almost done, guys. Can we thank God? Come on. Father, we thank you. God, we thank you. God, we thank you. God, we thank you. We thank you for this leader. We thank you for this man of God. We thank you, Lord God, that he has what it takes. You need to hear you have what it takes. You need to hear you have what it takes. Look at me. You got what it takes. God what it takes. You're not a disappointment. You're not letting anybody down. You have what it takes to be the father that you've always envisioned for yourself. God says the vision you have for yourself that you want to see for yourself. God says I'm going to show you how to do it in raising your children and being the husband you're supposed to be. Amen. So I just decree grace, grace, favor in Jesus name. Amen. God thank you. Thank you for this man of God. Thank you for this man of God. Thank you, Father, for what you're doing in his life, Lord God, that as he seeks to serve you, as he seeks, Lord God, to just fulfill the assignment and the agenda in which you have given him, Lord God, I thank you for clarity in the current season. I thank you, Lord God, that you give him the wisdom necessary to fulfill the assignments that stand before him in the name of Jesus. Oh, God, Father, whatever... I hear the Lord saying, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, in, in the season to come, there's going to be some doors that slam shut. I literally heard a, a, a door slam shut. And the Lord said, I'm slamming shut the door. He says, because it's not the door for you. I don't know what the door is, but I, I literally heard a door slam shut. And God says, it's for your good that I close that door. He says, and you're going to be encouraged. You're going to, he says, even though it's not going to make sense, even though it's not going to make sense, because in your heart you want the door to be the right door. And that may be in this season or the season to come, but I know what I just heard in the spirit. I literally heard a door slam shut in the spirit. And God says it is because I've got even more for you. I've got more for you. What I see, what I see. You're a cook, right? All right. Um, your wife is a baker, right? So you cook, she bakes. They're good, by the way. Um, what's the danger of eating something that's uncooked? Salmonella. Someone can get sick. Food poisoning. That's what the enemy wants to do. He wants you to receive something that's not cooked yet for you. And so... God says, I'm letting you see it because that's where you're headed. And God says, don't let age...
tell you I should be further than where I am. God says, I'm sovereign enough to ensure you're precisely where you're supposed to be. He says, so don't get concerned if the door doesn't open, but it closes. You get a chance to peek in. He says, it's just giving you an idea of what's next. But God says, I've got more work to do in you to prepare you. He says, and when the door returns, he says, you're going to be ready for it. You're going to be ready for it. You're going to be ready for it. As, 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 as much as I want to say there's a big door that's about to open, I hear what Paul says, there was a great door open before me, yet there were many adversaries. You got to be ready for the adversaries. Does that make sense? There's, there's adversarial attacks that will stunt your enjoyment of the door. And I don't want anything. The Bible says the blessing of the Lord make it rich and it adds no song. Ain't nothing like having something you regret. Because then you turn bitter towards the thing you've been praying for. Does that make sense? And so I hear the Lord saying, I'm going to ready you. I'm going to give you more skill set. I'm going to, I'm going to give you more endurance, spiritual endurance. I'm going to give you more knowledge so that when the door finally opens, it's here to stay. So, Father, I pray for the courage to experience that, walk through it. Thank you for the doors you have already set for him in this season of his life. Give him the wisdom necessary to walk through it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for your son. Thank you. Thank you for your son. Thank you for what you're doing in his life. Thank you for the doors you've opened for him. Father, thank you for uh, the many opportunities that you have set before him. Lord, I pray grace, grace. I pray you order every one of his steps in this season of his life. God says you already know what's next. I hear the Lord saying just do what I've already spoken to you in the past. I hear the Lord saying I'm not, I'm not giving you another word until you walk fully in the previous word. That's what I hear the Lord saying. So God says there are instructions that the things that I have spoken in your life, the things that I've asked you to do. God says, when you walk through those things and do those things, God says, you're going to see promotion. You're even going to experience peace like never before. You're internally conflicted on a lot of things. He says, it is because, it is because, um, if you go in my office, y'all don't judge me, but if you go in my office and you open a closet, it's a hot mess. Got stuff all over the place. Mail, old mail that ain't read, you know, old printers that don't work pens that are out of ink, just, it's just a mess, just a mess. Yeah, can y'all imagine I live like that in my office closet? The problem is, is I don't feel like cleaning it up. And I'm too ashamed to let anybody see it. So I ain't gonna let, you know, I have people come through the house every couple of weeks, they clean the house, but I tell them, don't open that door. Don't open that door, that door is fine. And I got it straightened enough, isn't it amazing we like to straight mess, keep it you know, but it's just, it's still dysfunctional and you look at it and know it needs to be cleared out. You know, it's, and here's why I have so much mess, but there's stuff in that is taking up space that could be used for something else. And I'm telling myself my office is not big enough. The problem is, is I need to remove the things that's taking up space that I held on to from a prior season. I hear the Lord saying, you got stuff that's taking up space that needs to be removed. And here's the thing, nobody can clean that for you but you. And God says, as you do that, as you take out the trash, as you clear out, as you sweep, as you straighten the areas of your life that needs to be touched. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong. There's nothing wrong with what's in the closet. I want, to hear, I want you to hear me. However, what's in it is not suitable for where I am right now. Does that make sense? I want to make sure I give clarity to the world. What's in it is not suitable for where I am right now. And because I'm holding on to it, it stunts where I am right now. And what I have right now makes me question if it's even God. So God, give him the courage to face it. In Jesus' name, amen. My God right here. Father, we thank you for Sheldon. Thank you for what you're doing in his life, Lord God. We thank you for grace, grace. We thank you for promotion. We thank you for open doors. We thank you, Lord God, that as you continue to show him who he is in this season of his life, God, thank you 
for the mantle, the mandate, Father, and the desires of his heart, that they would begin to come forth. You are a great father. You are a great son. You are a great man of God. I need to tell you that you're a great father, you're a great son, and you're a great man of God. I, sometimes we just need to hear it. You're a great father, you're a great son, and you're a great man of God. You're doing all that God requires of you right now. But I hear the Lord saying, a time is coming soon where the things will begin to turn. And God says, I'm going to be pushing you to get more out of your life. Specifically because of the daughter in which you are raising. Sikana Manso. The things you're going to have to speak into her and impart into her. But God says, in this season, I'm giving you cadence, I'm giving you rhythm, and you have what you need to do what it is that I've called you to do. In Jesus. Can we give God praise once again? Amen. I did not mean to go. I pray for you already. I pray for you. Oh, I didn't pray for you. I'm a made man. I don't need prayer. I know how to pray. I'm good. Stretch your hands in this direction. Father, we thank you for Manessa. We thank you for what you're doing in his life. We thank you for the next season to come. We thank you, Lord God, that um, he's coming into a new season, said the Lord. A new season. A new season that is marked with promise and destiny. That over the last 12 months, as you have been working to perfect your gift and working to perfect the things in which you do, I hear the Lord saying, now I'm bringing you into a place where others will be enamored by who you are. Because it's going to be out of nowhere that I'm going to be opening doors. The one area of your life, God says, continue to stay in a humble place. And as you continue to work on your humility, God says, the sky is not the limit. The sky is not the limit. I literally see you stepping in the sky and God is like, but that's not the limit. There's even more. 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 And so, Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus that the music that is going to come out of you is going to be music that presses and comes from the places of pain in your life that you've never verbalized. Pain in your life that you have kind of covered and just served on top of. I hear the Lord saying there's going to be anointings, there are going to be graces that's on your life to be able to produce music that administers healings in the atmospheres in the name of Jesus. I just decree and declare that in the name of Jesus, as a son, as a servant, as a man, God is making you in this season. He is. I hear the Lord saying you are made strong. That word has been in my spirit for the last couple of days, and I didn't know why. It was not until I just started praying for you that God says you have been made strong. Somebody shout, made strong. Made strong, made strong, made strong, made strong. You shall be able to do endure hardness like a good soldier. That as you endure, as you, as you, as you do what it is that God has called you to do, and even as you begin to serve, even with so many questions and concerns, but God says, I'm going to begin to open up the book. I'm going to be able to open up my word. And as you begin to read the epistles and begin to read the psalm, as you begin to read uh, the, the, the the Pentateuch, God says, out of that shall rise music that begins to penetrate the heart of men to do what it is that I've been calling them to do. I hear the Lord saying that I'm sending you into atmospheres. You're going to produce revival in atmospheres. You're going to send revival in the atmospheres. You're going to be able to go into traditional organizations and begin to bring revival, the fire and the power of God. I see in the name of Jesus that I hear, I see that you're walking even in churches where the traditionalism on the walls of churches, I see churches taking the names Church of God off the building. I hear, I see because of the ushering of the presence and the power of God that as God brings you into that atmosphere but I hear the Lord saying that your uniqueness and your, your, your uniqueness and the separation in which you experience that other people may not be able to understand but I see God using you like he used Ezekiel 
Ezekiel. Ezekiel. Ezekiel was interesting. He was strange because a lot of people didn't quite understand Ezekiel. But the Lord used Ezekiel and Ezekiel began to move at the pace and the cadence of the Lord. And God says that as you begin to do what it is that I've called you to do, God says uh, that as you serve others, others will serve you. God says nothing that you put out before men will fall to the ground. But I hear the Lord. Hey, glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Nothing that you put out will fall to the ground, but God says you're going to be able to eat in the next season. You're going to eat in the as you serve others for my sake, as you hear my voice, God says you're coming into a season where you will eat and you will eat well. Where you will eat and you will eat well. Where you will eat, you will eat well. Somebody just shout the words, you will eat well. Tell them you will eat well. Tell them again, you will eat well. You will eat well. Now let me say this to you. Be mindful of where you eat. 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 For where God is taking you. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a praise. I did not mean, I'm sorry. I did not mean to go this long in service. I actually said to myself, I'm getting them out at 11.15 today. But as you can see, we're at 12.18. Well, y'all blessed by the word of the Lord today, my man and his girl. I'm going to ask Pastor Fee to come, give her a mic, and she's going to dismiss us. We love you all with the love of the Lord. Thank you so much for the kind words. Let's stand. Amen. Can we bless the Lord for the word on today, for our apostle, for all of the men in the house? I am grateful for what was deposited here on today, and we do not apologize for the time. I promise you, Luby's is still open. Um, your reservation is still good. You'll still have time to get there. I'm just going to pray, and we're going to get out of here, but I want to let all the fathers know that we have something special set up for you in the foyer, so please, as you make your way out, Please stop, get a goodie, and just know that Connect Church loves you, and we honor you on today. Father God, I thank you for your presence at Medicine here in this room on today. We thank you for being a good, good father, for being the ultimate father and the ultimate shepherd. And Father, we thank you for putting men here on the earth to exemplify your goodness and your love and your kindness towards us. Father, we thank you for the word that we partook of on today. Let us hide it in our hearts that we would not sin against it. Father, let people know that we've been in your presence and give us an opportunity, open up a door, a moment for us to be able to share with someone else your goodness and your love and your kindness that they might be drawn into a relationship with you. Father, watch over us as we go about our day celebrating our fathers. Keep us, give your angels charge to watch over us until we come back together. It's in Jesus' name we pray and somebody shout amen.